space in scope and color like we've never seen before, all thanks to a massive telescope. NASA is now releasing the full set of images taken by the James Webb Space Telescope, the agency calling it the most complex observatory ever launched. NBC News correspondent Tom Costello has more. These images are really just spectacular. For the first time ever, we're seeing these deep, high-resolution images of our own universe. A kaleidoscope of galaxies as they appear 4.6 billion Heads in space! Heads in Welcome back to What Plus Live. Oh, it's that's the fucking deep, dumbest but... thing ever. <laughs> what? <laughs> fucking heads in space. I Don't blasphemize heads in space. It. It's the greatest thing we've ever done. Wow. It is the dumbest thing we've ever done, and that is exactly why I love it. It's Absolutely. It's like how... So this is our finale, by the way. Season three finale. We made it through a third season. Holy shit. New intro music. Right, and it's like, how do you want to start off our... And it should be something really big and grandiose and we're like no man fucking heads in space <laughs> um how you do it i am super excited about our guest tonight and i don't want to take a whole bunch of time up top i want to get through some uh housekeeping items and then we will go yes by the way you're right kev we do have new music jason and his band recorded a live version so shout out to jason it's very awesome see that i'm on like a 30 second delay just like the chat my brain just <laughs> twitched like that so um <laughs> Some housekeeping items, you know. We've been we talked to HF Pod today, so we've been doing a lot of this today. So I'm like a little bit, you know, uh, housekeeping items. So I apologize. So all tour, we are going to be doing after shows, all fish tour, 15 minutes off after encore for every single show this tour. Also on Wednesdays, we are bringing back the lot, which if you haven't been here for too long, you might not know about, but it was our flagship show that started this whole channel. Basically, I'm really excited to bring the lot back. Um, we'll be on the actual lot at a bunch of shows this tour. Uh, and then at Dick's, we got some things planned. So we'll get more into that, you know, at a later date. But like and subscribe uh, and follow us on all the socials. I think that was it. How do you, Kev? Is that good? Uh, you nailed it. We have uh, Amanda, my fish DJ, tomorrow for our first recap. I can't believe so. that's tomorrow. Are you ready? I mean, oh, we're all I'm like, yeah, ready. we'll do every show. And then it shows up and you're like, oh, damn, we got a lot oh, of work. Oh, crap, it's tomorrow? <laughs> Great. <laughs> Just got done watching Gettico. Now we're going full on right. fish. No, exactly. <laughs> hard left, hard left. Speaking of, our guest tonight is the manager of One Bobby Weir and a uh, now I consider a friend of the channel. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome <laughs> Mr. Matt Bush. Hey, hey. Hey, how, how you we doing, doing? Just fine. Good, so good. Uh, these guys have been exceptionally excited this week having <laughs> you come on. There's been a lot of energy. And normally I like to start the interview off, but I really want to throw it to Kev here because he was very excited to have you on and to have this show. Kev, do you want to start things off? Yeah. So I guess the nickel tour is uh, Matt worked with Lou Faber. Lou Faber came on. We met and I talked. He was like, I'll oh, come on. I said, that would be great. So I guess where I want to start is with God Street Wine and Lowe and, you know, how that turned into 
a career for you. Yeah, so like you guys, I was I was just a big fan. I was uh, a law school dropout working in a record store in 97. I mean, I first heard of God Street Wine, I think in like 91, early 92, going to college up in Albany. Um, and they've just done a long tour. And over the course of that tour, their merch person became the lighting guy. And so they were finding local merch people in every city and they were playing uh, up in Port Chester at Seven Willow Street for I think a two night run. And um, I knew this, their sound guy had become friendly with uh, through mutual friends we knew. And you know, I worked in a record store and could sell music and count money. And that's about what it took to qualify to do merchandise. And yep. You're probably I guess in the fall of 97 and I did pretty good the first night. They said, come back for night two. And then what are you doing next week? <laughs> right. I was in a van with God Street Wine pretty quickly shortly thereafter. Um, and then uh, about a year later, summer, uh, early 98, I had the opportunity to interview for Warren Haynes' management company to do, they were looking for someone to build a mail order merch company, what became oh, Mule cool. Merch. Um, uh, Warren and Alan had just left the Allman Brothers to do government real full time around then. That was so, that's um, 95 to when he passed. It was my favorite yeah. mule. The and I joined, days. I joined them summer in 90 or spring, late spring, early summer, 98, uh, 24 years old. <laughs> um, and was by, that your aspiration? Like, was that what you were looking to do prior to uh, being pulled on stage and doing that? Were you looking to get into the music business? Uh, tour merch was something I was now looking to do. Um, you know, when I went to law school, I thought maybe music attorney, but that, that didn't last more than a semester. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so working in a record store, your path is kind of tour merchandise. Um, and so, but by, by 20, you know, 24, I started with Warren and Hardhead Management. And by 25, I was tour managing Government Mule. It, it went nice. that quickly. Oh, wow. Um, in early 99, he was, he got the first call from Phil Lesh to do uh, Phil and Friends. Um, the first shows he was doing after the, the train page Warfield run. Um, and that's how I met the Phil camp and, about three years later, I left Warren and Government Mule and started working with Phil and Friends. Um, and then they started putting the dead back together in 03 and 04. Um, right, with Joan Osborne, nice. the Joan Osborne lineup, right? Yep. And then the Warren and Jimmy lineup. Um, right. And that's how I got to know, started getting to know Bobby and some of Bobby's people because those tours were generally put together. Um, you know, one person from Bob's camp, one person from Phil's camp, one person, you know, start filling these roles and that's how I started to get to know everybody. Um, so you're year, really good at networking, <laughs> right? Well, you know, the, 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 the details in these stories are how I managed to leave Warren to work for Phil, and no one was mad at me for that. Um, right. and then what about ultimately, when Phil ultimately leave Phil to work for Bobby, which was a little trickier? Um, but it worked. They it also was in a time, it was 2005, the 2004 Dead Tour did not end well, so Phil and Bobby were not getting along those couple of years. So I knew I was making a heavy ask, um, right. but Phil and Jill were really supportive of it. And uh, they thought it was, they thought I would be good for Bobby. And I guess, I guess they were right. Cause I, I was only hired to fill in as Bobby's tour manager in summer 2005. He had someone set up for the fall to take over right. and be the new permanent guy, um, which was fine with me. Cause I had plenty of fill work on the books. And uh, at the end of the, my six week run filling in, I uh, went on Bobby's bus just to thank him for the opportunity and for really the time of my life because I had a lot of fun working for Bobby was a lot of fun. Right. Um, <laughs> and he said, well, where are you going? I need to keep you. <laughs> and I, you know, he's one of the nicest people you meet. And I thought this is just him being one of the nicest people you meet. Right. And I was like, ah, you know, I got Phil dates in the fall and you got, you know, Steve was coming in to take over and he goes, no, 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 I really am going to keep you. It's like, okay, great. I want to stay. Right. <laughs> I don't know what else to say at that point. I really think he's just being nice. And, right. you know, next day, uh, Rat Dog Tours back then, 2005, I mean, almost all of us flew in and out of SFO. I was living in Berkeley, California at the time. So I'd taken 15 people to the airport the next day. And I think we went into like a United Lounge or something. And I was hungry. So I went to look for food. And no one else came with me. I went. I came back 20 minutes later. And they were all sitting in some conference room. And Bobby waves me in. And he goes, I just took a vote the whole band and crew, and we all want you to stay. <laughs> so there that you is, go. And so that's I knew, okay, awesome. this is for real. This wow. Is for real. That's pretty um, gratifying too, to and, know you did such a good job with the. Yeah. I don't know, really know what I did. <laughs> I feel like I was treading water the whole summer, but it's amazing. Um, 
And it's amazing yeah. that to start, like you said, going from being a fan, because to like you said, like we were saying backstage before, I was a huge God Street Wine fan. And to, to, to be able to get a job doing anything for any band is like, especially if you like them, that's a really, you know, like you're like, what can yeah, I do for you? You, you know, we always you talk were, about shooting things or like filming things or whatever. And you're like, what can I do? Like, I'll carry your luggage if, if that gets me. There's a lot of luggage something. carrying. Careful what you wish for. <laughs> right? but, but look what it led to. Like, you know, sometimes you just got to get your foot to crack. Especially with the up and coming like, bands, you stay in hotels with stairs and there's no bellman. That's, uh... Exactly. exactly. <laughs> and you're hiking them up. The... But then they're like, hey, this guy doesn't mind carrying our luggage. Maybe he'd be willing um, to do this and this. I mean, I thought I made it when I was God Street Wines merch guy making $20 a show in peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I could. Totally. Well, yeah, because you're that's like, I'm 24, that's how I felt. Yeah. yeah. That Free music I every night. I had, I, at the beginning so. of the summer, it had crossed my mind to try to get a job at Meriwether Post Pavilion just so I could see free shows all the time. Yeah, but I would hate to work like vending at a show, though. I feel like that Slinging would be a beer to a bunch of drunks. That's, uh, uh, selling merch, it, it comes, you know, <laughs> you got to have it takes patience. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think you're really <laughs> at least at like a place like MPP. I don't think you're really able to be in the show. Right. Like you're, it's so loud and it takes your attention. You got to be. Out I, I mean, you can hear out there because I walk I walk. You know, well. Pre-COVID, I walk the entire house of every show almost every night, uh, you know, including behind the lawn, right. along the concourse. You, you can usually keep up with, uh, um, you can usually hear the music. I mean, I, the other day I had to go out to the front of the box office during sound check and I make it hear, uh, now I know how they all hear sound check because it's blasting right. through through shakedown, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Love that. So um, <laughs> when did you start? I have to remind them to kill the house sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> When did you start taking on set list duties in this trajectory or in this timeline? So I was Bobby's tour manager in 2005. In the fall of 2008, he promoted me to be his manager, um, though I never left the road when when he told me he, you know, and he let go of John Sharon, Cameron Sears uh, for that to happen. I said, I didn't want to leave the road. Um, you know, now I have probably half a dozen other management partners um, as, as, as we sort of grown into a management bureaucracy with Bobby. Um, but I never wanted to leave the road. I thought, you know, from my experience and what I could tell why Bobby was offering me this, it was because of the hey, job I was one. doing on the road right. and his life is touring and sure there's, there'll be albums to make and brand deals to do and things like that, but his life's the road. And I don't know how you can manage a guy like that and not be there with him. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, to really see firsthand how every show, whether it, what's good and what's bad. And, can I, can I ask, I was watching you in Philly and you had the headphones on. Are you listening to Weir's mix or the whole band's mix? Uh, I've got it's it's a Weir centric mix. I don't think it's Bobby's monitor because that would it would sound worse than what I'm hearing. It would be very specific to him. Right. Um, so it, it's it's he's turn it, it's got his vocal turned up. That's what I really need want to hear is his vocal and his guitar. I really need to go out front to hear that. It's harder to judge that off the headphones. Um, but I'm really listening to for his voice uh, when, when I have the headphones on and sound check. I'm listening just to hear what they're talking about. So when they're talking through the Mike's Did off you in the do house anything with that information? That. What What is um, your reasoning for it? I just, you know, want to hear. It. It's really, is you know, how he's how his voice is sounding. Is he on? Is he strong? Is you know what? Does what, he ask you for feedback is. after the shows, or do you guys ever discuss um, that, or is it more? See, that's the thing is he asked me for feedback so randomly that I just know I have to be prepared <laughs> every night. I got to know how his voice is sounding <laughs> and how his guitar is sounding in the house. Yeah. Um, and I want to know the, the house mix anyway. I mean, our front of house engineer is also our production manager. He's a long time guy with us. And, uh, you know, not a lot of people, I'm one of the, I'm one of the only people who will criticize him. Um, so I need to sometimes go out front to, you know, right. just for that. Mixing um, for a stadium has to be crazy with the, yeah, with the delay towers and yeah. Um, so then to answer the, the original question that was posed, um, the end of the 2009 dead reunion tour, um, we had a one-off two months after the proper tour had ended July 4th at Rothbury. And at that point we knew that was going to be the last show. Um, Bob and Phil were doing okay, but Bob, Phil and the drummers, not so much. Um, we were already starting to talk about what was going to become further. Um, and so, you know, there was a rotation between the band guys who wrote set lists on the tour. No one remembered who wrote the last set list. And in a way, in order to almost prevent that just causing a fight, I wrote one and sent it to Bob and Phil. And so what do you guys think about this for Rothbury on July 4th? And they both loved it. They didn't change a thing. Um, and I forget who sent it to Bill and Mick, but it got signed off on. And 
that was the last show the dead played in 2009 and then we did a rat dog tour straight from there and then we put further together and as we were sort of making the arrangement for the band knowing we were bringing in joe russo who was going to have a lot of music to learn quickly and john k while he knew all the songs it's the arrangements that you know you got to get used to because you know they're not necessarily doing you know it, 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 the music is evolving all the arrangements are a little different and so getting set lists out the night before the show was going to become an important priority so people could spend the day woodshedding before sound check um so it, the decision was made that jill lesh and i would take turns writing them every other show wow and so basically every other show through the entire career further jill and i alternated sometimes it was phil and i and jill got busy do you guys um, ever like get competitive about it? Like who would write the better set list? Or... Um, like, did you pay were... close attention to what she was writing? We paid close attention to each other. And I think there was a, often when, you know, in the five year career of that band, there was some ups and downs. And so I think we often sent some messages back and forth in set lists. And, uh, <laughs> but, um, um, I, I remember I... one particularly testy set list I wrote where, where I felt like every song I gave Phil to sing had something to do with going home or leaving or, you know, moving on and every song bobby had was about love and light and you know <laughs> um, um can i can i ask then when you guys did the second side of abbey road over that series of shows did you and jill say hey we're gonna throw in one song every night that was fully a lesh idea they get all the credit for that one okay um that was their idea and then we just sort of got into who's singing what and and um, it was neat and, it's really neat I, I their, always... their their concept was that side b you know the whole the whole suite would be played on Phil's birthday. And so it was set up to run into that. Um, and so that would be in the second set of Phil's birthday. And then we'd do the rest of the dead set and then come back with the hidden track as the last encore. Okay. Um, well, that's cool. That's so cool. And so that's a lot of thought does go in. Day. A lot of thought does go into a lot of these then sort of. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I, I spent too much time on them probably. I mean, I, I, I uh, did an interview with, uh, uh, I forget, but... Um, I was asked how long it takes me and and my answer it takes me as long to write them as it does for them to play them that also includes the, the two-hour sound check do you do you um, have like do you go through and you have like an an estimated that's every four nights five nights it pops up do you think of it like that master so in the beginning of dead and company i was a little more rotation focused um and and the problem would be i would sometimes box myself into a corner Mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and and be left with, you know the biggest problem is second set songs um there's a ton of first set songs and there are a little bit less second set songs um and so i sometimes block myself in a corner where all i have left is a second set that's basically all the same songs as a second set four or five nights ago and then i gotta just blow shit up um because that's the only way i can handle now, that i'm not does, gonna be able to make the, the same the band, so different. does the band um, say certain songs are second because you did the estimated was in the first set in Philly, which is probably a second set song. There are I haven't. It's easier for me to put second set songs in the first set. Um, they, uh, you know, they they rarely fight that. Um, they know what I'm going for when I'm doing that. Um, it's getting first set songs in the second, which Dead and Company has been good at. At you know, if I had a longer tour, there would be more of that happening. You know, last night I had that Hell in a Bucket come out of out of yeah, dark you know yes. space dark star hell in a bucket and i mean it was one of the most rousing versions of hell in the bucket i've ever heard both in audience response and bobby oh, they singing nailed it. it that um, was so perfect and what i noticed was certain song like brown eyed women we did in the second set i think in in either in foxborough or the day after row or, or earlier maybe mm, i don't know if it was second set there but maybe okay. um and you know a lot of these first set songs they're in the fourth fifth slot People still finding their way in. They're still on a beer line, food line. They're, you know, the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. drug choice of the night hasn't really kicked in yet, mm -hmm. and and so it's it's a little more. There's a little more background music in in the daylight set, and so doing brown eyed women in the second set under the lights with like the full house engaged was was incredible. The sing along was was deafening, and, and I had a similar thing with that with Ramble on Rose. I put in the second set earlier in the tour, and that really worked. Althea is now a second set song. I mean, no one even. I was going to say it, that. Yeah, that never gonna, was. Yeah, Same was with Dion. Is that yeah. you? I mean, is that yeah? I, I've, like I've, we know I've, that I've, as fans, but we're talking to the guy that kind of made that happen. Yeah, I it, I basically made it happen. I mean, with with John's the songs John sing, I'll go to him and say, "How do you feel about you know, particularly Althea?" I think that's really the only one I've asked him about. Uh, Althea, I would go to him and say, "How do you feel about opening the show with that tomorrow night?" Fucking a, he's never he's 
you know, every every Althea ask I've had, he's been super excited about. I went to about Althea to like open a show. Guy. That would Althea be to open things. set two, Althea to come out of space, and Althea to, as an encore. And I was just going to say the forum show the, um, in 2019, which is, I was going to bring this up later, but I, I got to bring it up now because you just said that coming out of space. He did Althea out of drum space, which was the show that you guys opened with Viola and then did the Bertha and then back into Viola and then did the yeah. second set cold open of Viola. Yeah. What was the thinking with, I mean, that was, that's one of my, that was Bobby. I don't want to say chasing Bobby, songs, but um, was, was the one who chopped up Viola that night. That one was all him. That's um, it was. I yeah. was blown away. Like I was. Just I like, put it. I forget where I put it in the set. I may. I may have had it in the first set. I think originally, and then he just spread it out. Um, and I and and often I need him to do that because I I never played guitar or piano or you know I was a failed drummer by high school and um, so Same. I can't read music. I don't know chord change. I often write stuff and Bob or John be like, okay, that. I got to put down a guitar, pick another one up, re to, you know, like I won't be able, we can't put a segue there or we got to move something around if we want to do a seamless, seamless set. So I'll need them to tweak those parts of it sometimes, but, That's but not as often as I expected I would have yeah. to do. Um, how far ahead do you usually plan? Like you don't, how far ahead do you plan the set list for the show? Really? When you lay them, when you lay it out? Um, everything's different. Um, starting a tour is hard. I have to be, and as crazy as it sounds, if I'm doing a Wolf Bros tour, I can't think about Dead and Company. If I'm doing Dead and Company tour, I can't think about a Wolf Bros set. Even though it's a lot of the same songs, it's just such a different animal that, that I really need to be in the right frame of mind. So when a tour is coming up, I, I'm kind of waiting just for the right frame of mind to hit me. Um, and, and an idea can hit at any time. I could be listening back to something. I could be reading something and go, oh, that would be cool. And I just jot it down with whatever show date I'm thinking. It could be, like I could have two songs for the fourth show of tour before I've written anything for the first show of tour, just because an idea hit me. Or someone said something, hey, you know. You realize um, in this city this thing happened. Well, that's what I was going to say. Well, I mean, going for instance, going into this tour, I knew based on, you know, knowing a little bit about politics and Supreme Court schedules, that decision was going to come out while we were on tour. And so I, I banked throwing stones and women are smarter until that happened. Well, that's what I was um, going to say. Do certain dates and certain certain venues or certain cities you write into sort of those things, sort of knowing it's coming? Or like, you know, sometimes I mean, I'll, I'll write Blackford always... Wind into St. Louis. Um, right. And like, the Saturday Woodstock night, you set know, you guys Saturday did, night. the Bethel set you did that was Woodstock. Uh, that was, yeah, that was so that I got that idea. Um, I, so I actually had that idea for Woodstock 50 when Dead and Company was booked to do that, but that never happened. Um, and it, came it was so so far from ever happening that i never even brought that idea up to the band yet um <laughs> when we started that tour and woodstock was early so i'm trying to think i, I went up to each of the four each each of the core four first and then O'Teal and jeff to basically sell the idea to them that how uh, that i think i could put the whole woodstock set right before drums and then i'll do like a basically a, you know do the whole, whole rest of the set try to keep it pre-72 where I, I think i think i kept that for the theme that night i might have done a different ballad but um, and I went to each guy and they all loved it. And so, and do you typically did. have to get approvals from everybody in the band? Like, does everyone sign off on it or there's no, like, I don't have a rule book for this. Um, right. I, I'm, I'm trying, you know, I, I, I approach this from the fact that I don't have to play this stuff every night. I feel like a coach with the, you know, right. with yeah. the notepad, um, with right. the playbook, um, they got to play it. So it, it's really up, up all about them. And, and I don't want to surprise them with a wacky idea. Because if they don't go for it, that has to be okay. You know, I tell them that all the time. Like, please, like, if you don't like my ideas, by all means, way. like, um, they, give super... me, they give me a lot of latitude. I mean, it's pretty crazy how much latitude they, yeah. they give me in reality. I mean, it's you know, a before really the, smart the show idea, you were at, though. Kevin, um, when John came into Soundcheck that day, he referenced some some interview that I I, I don't know. Uh, you know, he knew it like the back of his hand, but it was Rick Rubin interviewing Jay-Z about 99 Problems, and he just turned to me and said, Matt Bush, you're fucking crazy for this set list, but I think it's going to work. <laughs> and that was the Philly show. Um, <laughs> the Philly show was off the hook. That's incredible. Real quick, going off of that, I'm just going to segue to this real quick. What was it like writing the set list for Fare Thee Well, then all those shows? Did you have kind of an idea going in what you guys needed to play so and what you wanted to play? That was collaborative. Um, okay. That was Phil, Jill, Bobby, me, and and Trey. Um Though there was a lot of it was on paper already by the time we trace, we, we, by the time we saw Trey for the first time, um, Phil and Jill had the idea of trying to play the whole songbook sort of in chronological order, and that's why Levi's Stadium started. Oh. Come back, come back, come back, come back. Three, oh, yeah. um, but that wasn't really sustainable to get. You know, like that was gonna that wasn't gonna work for Chicago. So. 
Um, so, you know, we did have to spread it out a little bit in the end, uh, but we, we had uh, Trey came out. I can't remember what month it was at this point. I mean, maybe April and we spent like a day out in out on the beach with the, you know, it's probably Bobby Tasha, Trey, uh, Richard was with Trey, me, Phil, Jill, maybe one or two other people. And then they did like a, the trio just rehearsed a Terrapin. And that was when I kind of remember us all sitting around some on bar stools and some tables with like all the set lists and master song lists spread out. And that's kind of when singers were being all apportioned and, and, uh, um, that's kind of how those lists came together. Um, I don't did think they you changed guys much know, from there till, till the end. Um, did you guys know at that time when Trey was going to get his first song in? Like, had that been discussed? Because I know, like, in Chicago, we always had to let Trey sing, you know, like, getting into it. And then, of course, he finally did. But was it sort of that thing to wait on it? Or, like, was it – how did that kind of It wasn't about? unconsciously. Um, you know, it wasn't unconsciously that 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 was, that his more, more songs were going to come later. Um, you know, we – Bobby's going to want to sing half the songs in almost any dead band he's in. You know, he's he's used to Jerry, Bobby, Jerry, Bobby, Jerry, Bobby, Jerry, Bobby, right. and Phil gets one here and Brent or right. Ben's got one there and or Bruce. And and that's kind of the MO he wants to keep. Um, I don't think any of us expected Phil to take that many songs. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. It, it, it's hard for me sometimes with – Bobby and Phil and everybody singing Jerry tunes because they don't nail the phrasing exactly right. And like Bobby adds the Lost Hunter verse to Friend of the Devil. I don't know if that Phil was did that too idea. though. And Phil used yeah. to take that verse and further. Okay. Bobby used to. I think it was used to be Bobby John K back and forth on that song and further. And then Phil would come in just for that verse. For just for um, that. And so Bobby wanted to keep me. that verse with Dead and Company, right. and he brought it up and just said he would he would take it with. If, with I, Dead and if anybody for um, me, Mayor nails when he does a Jerry song. He nails the phrasing, I think, because he's such a student of it. He wasn't part of other, it. Other than we all missed that, he was singing that line in Althea backwards up until this summer. Until <laughs> <Dave> Gans, so <laughs> <laughs> finally got a message to him about it. I, mean, I don't know how every one of us missed that, but we all did. Um, well, that's an interesting point, though, that Kemp brings up, because he does always, like, I always say, oh, I still love this song. And he's always like, yeah, but it doesn't sound like when Jerry's singing. And I'm like, yeah, but it's like the new. It evolves. You can't compare I mean, Bobby it. Right? Sang it days, be... Bobby just sang Days Between now more than Jerry ever did. Right. And it has to um, be that way. And, you know, we talked to Benji um, in New York this this summer, and he kind of led onto an interesting thing where he was like, Bobby's a storyteller. And that's sort of like the way he sings the songs, too, is like he likes to tell the story of the song. And that's sort of where it's changed and how it's kind of evolved into that. And after Benji said that to me, I was like, that makes a lot more sense on how some of these songs sound now. And when you take that as the grain of salt into it, it really, to me, it makes it, I mean, I never had a problem with it anyway, but now it makes it even more why he does that and acceptable to me is that it's really telling that story and doing it his way. And that's how, you know, when, when, we decided on this set list rotation for further. Um, then he sat down with me to sort of talk about the songbook. And that was a lot of what he told me is these shows tell a story. And I love and, it. And, uh, you know, you can have a story in mind. And, and you know, I had got to, it was actually really amazing that I had this conversation with Maureen Hunter at Shoreline uh, at the beginning of this tour. Um, I will sometimes write a show and I learned she watches every Dead and Company stream. Um, I oh, had wow. no idea. And, wow. and, and, and <laughs> I didn't learn it until, you know, after sound check, even, right. even that, that day. And I looked at the set list and I went, Oh fuck. And, and I never regretted a set list more than ever. And it was great, of course, but I was like, Oh no. I was like, no, like I needed to do something totally. Like I didn't know she was coming until really right. last second. And, um, and he, I got for, so for people, if, nervous. If people don't know, <laughs> um, I think Matt is referencing uh, Robert Hunter's wife. Yes. Yeah. And so what, you know, I told her, I was like, some nights I write a show and I think this is the story they're telling, or I think it, it's going to have this meaning. And then they start playing it and it's something completely different. Um, and that's kind of the beauty of it is because yeah. someone else in the audience is probably having a completely different experience with it. Oh, that's the and, beautiful thing and about it. And art. it's timeless. Yeah. yeah and it's yeah. some of the stuff he wrote in the sixties, some of it he wrote in the nineties and it's in the same show, uh, yeah. advancing the and same narrative. Exactly. And being played today differently than it could have been played back then, or, but, but it's still that same story of the song. I, I the love song that is. you guys do do the days between and the, what, Foolish Heart, I guess that's a later one that you've incorpororated. Yeah, that one just came out this tour. Yeah. Yeah. 
Now, now, did you have to go to the band and say, "Hey, guys, let's break out the Mister Fantasy this tour"? Did one of the so, band come to um, you? It's uh, yes so to all of that. Um, some <laughs> songs have come out because I've pushed them to do it. Uh, you know, early on, I, the Eleven I love, and so I pushed that hard early on. Um, this summer, most um, Fantasy and Jude came. So, so there were multiple conversations early? happening oh, at once. Um, Singing Back Home, I think, was John's idea. Okay. Um, so there was a band thread going, and then there was a, a me, Bobby, back and forth going. Then a I was band on the band thread, thread for a minute, you know, the, yeah, the six. And then I was on that thread for a minute. Wow. Then I had a conversation with Bobby's wife where we were like, we were talking about a Brent something, and we were like, no, it's got to be Dear Mr. Fantasy. And I think, so I think she got Bobby pushing fantasy. Um, but it sounded like John was already pushing fantasy. So that may have come from two different directions at once, which is very possible. Um, then, you know, it definitely is the right choice, right? Foolish Heart was, was me. Was, like yeah. That. Foolish Heart was me to Bobby. Um, I know he'd been wanting to do that one for a while. So sometimes it's just a matter of me reminding him. And then, uh, you know, when they come out of rehearsal, if they still haven't gone into one, then I have to, the only way they can learn a new one on the tour is to sound check it. So I got to start putting songs they don't know on set list, but with an option out. So I'll put Foolish Heart or, and I did that for like five shows in a row. So they would remember to sound check Foolish Heart. Right. Um, and then, you know, eventually that was able to come out. Uh, Supplication was an audible. He just did it. That was not planned. They never rehearsed it with John. Uh, I'm guessing Jeff helped guide him through it. <laughs> isn't that in some weird time um, signature? So they, they've, in the middle of Uncle John's band, they can actually, they've naturally in the past fallen into a supplication ish jam. You know, they mm -hmm. sort of fall into the theme. It's, it's like seven. Seven four maybe I think yeah um, might be like estimated yeah um, just like estimated and so they were falling into that in the middle of Uncle John sometimes and they did it again that and Bobby just started singing it I think because he had been singing it with Wolf Rose with some he wanted to bring out in the spring that he hadn't sung in open you know at least eight years and uh, I think he just thought oh wait I sing when this starts and so he just so, so why it. why no Lazy Lightning then uh, he keeps saying he's got to rewrite the words to that which means he doesn't want to do it anymore um, <laughs> nice. um, Fair enough. So I, I don't I don't even bother pushing him on that anymore. I, I bring it up once a year. I'll just throw it out. Usually tongue in cheek just to see how it will react. Um, how does... I'd how rather does, save my real ass for something that might actually happen. Right, right, <laughs> right. Totally. How does how does it work with getting O'Teal involved then in what songs he sings? Because I know our so a Wookiee Award winning O'Teal had mentioned on our show one time that seeing China Doll was a big win for him. Like it really meant something to him to be yeah. able to sing that song. And now... I know he sings Fire more, which I Comes love. Time. Do Fire, yeah, and that. Too. So I think he started with Fire because Bobby doesn't sing that one. Can John, I think, sang it first, but it was like, it's really tough yeah. for him. You know, Teal's like, I could do it. So he got it by default, really. And then I think similar thing happened with China Doll. And then once he nailed China Doll, I remember we, we went to Shoreline. We had Shoreline coming up, and I went to him and his tech right after. I said, learn comes a time because I know Bobby doesn't sing that one. Um, like I just started thinking what's next that Bobby that wouldn't mm -hmm. want to sing. And so that one I gave him, um, he chose world to give. And I mean, considering Bobby barely remembered the song or Billy or Mickey. <laughs> all right. Teach it to us. You know? <laughs> and so he made that. Happen. Is that then, why it's then, disappeared? We haven't and, uh, seen that one in a while. It came out, uh, came out of Bethel. Or, oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. That's really interesting to hear because I was wondering how O'Teal only singing ballads creates a problem in that there's only, you know, in, in order to help X number. in order to help keep tempos up, uh, I tried to only do one first set ballad, one second set ballad. And so Bobby's gonna get the second set ballad. Um right. and often Bobby or John are gonna get the first set ballad. So unfortunately I've, I've run out of slots to have spots for O'Teal's O'Teal songs. Um, I, did, I guess that has a I can big occasionally impact. stick one early second set, but I don't like to do it too much, you know, because yeah. Those ballads um, have a big impact on the tempo and feel of the other songs. Is like, do you notice? Because that's a well. I don't know how much you're into what the fans are talking about online, but like tempos are of like of the set and of the individual songs is a big topic among the fan base. Yeah, and I'm wondering if you conscious. take that into consideration. Very much so. I got to be careful what I surround a ballad with because oftentimes you think a song is going to be a little more rocking, and then it's done mid tempo or slow, and then it's followed by a ballad, and you go, oh shit. Um, and, then someone, you know, and then someone calls me in the dressing room to go, why'd you write the set so slow? And I'm like, this one was supposed to be faster. <laughs> um, 
so I do try to be conscious of that. Um, and so in, in a way I've put one less ballad in a show more often than not. Um, so to, uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you that, that, that was their drinking game, Katie. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm putting it together. You know, I saw a question earlier that I do want to answer. Uh, the, the Philadelphia Rainbow and all rainbows related to the Grateful Dead come from Peter Shapiro's Rainbow Maker 3000 machine. Yes. Um, <laughs> we paid a lot of money for that fairly well, and so we have to occasionally break it out from, from time to time. The well, Philly well, Rainbow well, was my daughter's first dead show. I mean, it was Dead and Company, but I, we brought her to that show. It was a great show. Oh, that was the rain. That was the one set. That was, yeah, that was the one set rain. That was the Hurricanes to Come set. <laughs> yeah, but still, I had a blast. Though. They there with the weather guy who goes, well, this is going to happen tonight at some point. So you're going to have to, you know, there's no way you're getting through the show. And so we decided we're going to start on time and we're going to play until the lightning comes. It's always about it. lightning. Lightning or wind. Those, that's what stops the show. Rain doesn't matter. Lightning. Oh, I've been to, lightning I've been strikes to usually, in the rain. <laughs> yeah, lightning strikes are usually, uh, uh, you know, there's usually a city or county regulation yeah. about that. And wind is, you know, your gear is going to fall on someone's head. If I, you, I call it the softball. The wind is too strong. When my so, kids played um, softball, if there was a lightning, we got a warning half hour off the field until you saw no lightning. Yeah. Like the that's, last time you saw it. Yeah. Yeah. It's usually, it's usually that they got to, everyone's got a shelter in place. And then it's no lightning strikes within that miles for either 20 minutes or 30 minutes, depending on the city. And then you got to wait for everyone to get back into the, into the field. Um, right. And so, you know, that can push it on a little bit. And, you know, my first question every time we have to stop for weather goes, how much more than how much curfew are you giving us back? Because I want to make up as much on the back right. end as I can get. And you don't always get it. Some cities. And are you the guy negotiating and, and figuring out all that stuff as well? Is that also part of your um, I'm the guy asking for it because I'm the guy that has to work with the time. But it's not up to me. I mean, I'm going to tell them what the band wants, but then they're going to tell me what you know, it's it's not always in our power to do anything about it. And it's not right. always just about money. Like sometimes it's just noise ordinance and you just can't. Right. And they lose their permit to do shows if X, Y, Z happens after a certain time. And, you know, that was more the situation in Foxborough where I didn't get any time back. Um, Philly, I get a little bit of time. I had, you know, that's, we were able to play a little late in Philly. Uh, well, that's a cool um, area too. But, it's separated from the residential, yeah. right? Where the sporting arenas are. Yeah. So I feel like they're a little more flexible there. Yeah, we we if there was weather in Philly, we had a half hour to play with if if we needed it um for that, but we we thankfully didn't need it. Um yeah, it's, there... it's the worst part of my job. The part I hate the most is I'm the guy who has to walk out on stage and tell them they have to stop playing immediately and get off right. stage. And oh, there's that must nothing suck. I like less. Or that they've really run out of time. And and I I, I have broken more curfews and probably, I mean, maybe not more than Axl Rose, but, but I've broken a lot of curfews because I have a very hard time telling Bobby, Billy, and Mickey at this stage right. in their career, you can't do one more song. One show, <laughs> right, right. One show there was that. no encore this tour, I think. Yeah, sometimes I... Yeah. I they just do run out of time. Right. There's just nothing we can do about it. I feel it. like they've done really um, good, though, this tour of being like on time as far as starting. I, I went to the Dodger Stadium show and it was very much like 7 15 we started. Nobody got else out. got in, but I feel know. like we've <laughs> messaged, I feel like we've messaged a little better that we start on time. Yeah. You know, we, 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 we do the set list posts every night. We put the time the next show is starting and this isn't a say, don't show. be late for a reason. <laughs> right. And um, you always post that kind of thing that's like, know what you're doing because the reality is time. you know shakedown's a lot of fun no one wants to be yeah. in the venue any longer than they have to they want to walk in right when the music starts but forty thousand people can't walk into a stadium at the same time it does not work and so some people just have to come in early because if there's a bottleneck at the door and the promoter or venue feel it's unsafe and we have to hold the show for that then i have to start cutting songs on the end because right. they're not going to give us more time for that right that's not a, a weather on you know act of god emergency that we could get more time for so in reality that the choice to stay out longer and come in later can cost songs and it has cost songs. Um, you know, city field last year, we had to hold and you know, for me, what felt like an, un an awful 30 minutes because there was uh, an ugly bottleneck at, at the, the field entrance and, and I had to chop two songs, one song off each set. And you're the wow. guy that tells the band that. And then I have to go, go tell the band that, and which song that I think sucks. we should cut. <laughs> that's, that's no fun. Um, I imagine not. That sounds terrible. <laughs> no, I, I like adding. I like going out there and saying, you know, throw throw one more in and do this or something, you know, because it came up short right. or something. Um, or, hey, we have the extra, you know, now we have 40 minutes in Boulder. Let's do a third set. You know, let's do Terrapin and two other songs for the encore. That's awesome. Um, well, it's so cool there, to see behind the scenes how these things come together, because I feel like as fans and being at the shows, we have like theories and talk about it. But like. The reality is actually kind of, in my opinion, just as cool, if not cooler, than 
you know, all this. What we imagine. Right. What <laughs> yeah. you imagine. Right. Absolutely. And I mean, there's also a little bit like dry business side to it, but I guess that's, you know, that's part of it, right? Yeah, so. of course it's part of it. You know, I mean, what, you know, we're, we're guests in every venue. We're guests in every city. We, we we're aware of the, you know, the, the traveling circus that we bring along with us the impact that you um, make. And, and we love Band them and we love, right. But, but we, you know, we try really hard to treat communities as like we are guests in, in their town. And do you have a home. favorite? That's what uh, I was going to say. Favorite venue. Yeah, I was going to ask that too. I mean, there's a lot, the gorge, red rocks, Madison square garden. I mean, the obvious, you know, the obvious choices, you know, um, baseball stadiums are weird. I'm a huge baseball fan. So I love that side of it, but it's not the best. A little awkward. Concert, yeah. And, yeah. And, and everything is so far in away. Field, like like, like you, when you're in the field, need... you can cut across things. I have to do everything yeah. in the wide oval around it. So it's like a mile and a half for me to get to the box office some days or yeah, that's or a, go a, see that's a friend in, 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 you know, in, in a, in the house bar or something, it's like it'd be like a mile and a half walk. Yeah. And that becomes not possible. It's a great um, venue. It's just not a great concert venue at Dodger Stadium. Like it's a fun place yeah. to go and see, but it's a little, it's yeah, it's a little too big. But then you go somewhere. Dodger like Stadium Wrigley. I like the least. In yeah. the city field, we've gotten down a little bit. Wrigley, we've gotten down for sure. Wrigley I actually like doing a lot. Uh, yeah, because we had kind of gotten it down too. Smaller and you don't feel as cavernous. But man, Dodger yeah. Stadium, I was even on the floor and it was like a little too much. And then you go up in the stands and you're really far away. And they still got the side nettings up, which is hard. You know, it's like there's a lot of more obstacles and stuff kind of that you're And nobody with. on the I, infield. They have the, always have the infield. Yeah. With nobody there, which is so weird to look down when you're yeah. like, <laughs> yeah, and then it, face straight back from there. Like the stands yep. are usually empty there too, so it's kind of and it's got to be weird for the band too to kind of, I don't know, from stage see such a. There's still what like fifty thousand, sixty thousand people there, but because it's such a massive stadium, it's so spread out and doesn't when the look. upper decks are full it, it's it's a great look from the stage so um, so why know, choose the baseball stadiums instead of the football stadiums the football stadiums you really need you know we can sell you know thir in the 30s sometimes forty thousand tickets to the baseball stadiums but in the 20s they'll still look okay 20 in the football stadium doesn't you really need right. to be selling you need everybody come down on the floor right yeah you need to more springsteen numbers to to, to do the well what goes stadium. into deciding to play um, dodger stadium say over like the bowl um, instead of playing hollywood bowl or something i think that was because we've just done three hollywood bowl with the last shows at the at just in done. october yeah yeah and yeah. and you know and knowing the length of time we had to work with we didn't yeah. want to do three in la again so it was one and go um and we wanted to start sense. in la so we could just be rehearsing closer to home and all that yeah no, that's Ooh. great that's cool in there too. <laughs> <laughs> had to get that comment on there. Oh, my. So, so can I, I, go ahead, Tim. No, by, you're doing great, Kev. I, I was going to make a left it. turn because there's a couple things we wanted to ask you about. And I guess the first is Bobby when he sat in with Fish. Did you have part of the set list writing for that? Like getting Bobby to sing Trey song? So, and um, Trey reached out to Bobby while we were in New York. Our next show was we were on the Campfire Band tour um for bobby's blue mountain record and we had a show kind of the ryman and we were supposed to we stayed in new york to do colbert maybe and then maybe he just well, i think wanted to hang in new york and then we we're going to go to nashville the day before the show and fish was doing their run there and so it, they hit me he's like we have to get to nashville earlier than planned so i want to go do this so at some point he had a list of songs already and then patrick sent me like uh, a dropbox with with the you know versions of them for him to listen to we were on the plane to Nashville when Bobby, you know, he was woodshedding on the plane and uh, he was singing along. He was playing Miss You, but he's starting to sing along to it. And he's like, I think this is the best ballad I've ever heard Trey write. I, I, want, I think I want to sing this one. What, what do you think wow. he'll say? I'm like, nice. like, I'll ask Patrick. See what's a lot up. of fish fans don't agree with um, Bobby, but that's a cool um, take. Um, and so I sent a note to Patrick and I mean, they were touched. They were, so let's see how it goes at Soundcheck. And then, then Bobby's like, I'll give him playing in the band. And you know, no, it was just so cool, cool too. Because um, as I think in his, you know, you know, in his mind, he, you know, this is only a year after he wore electric like tracing shirt on stage multiple right. times. Um, so I think he wanted to do something like that, and so the trade, you know, was, was what he went for. Um, so the fun thing about that day is we got there to sound check, and they went on and just for some reason started jamming on walking blues, and I think they jammed on for like forty <laughs> minutes. Um, it was really just to, you know, get your levels, feel things out. Um, and then they came off stage at the open doors and, you know, Trey came up to Bobby and I said, you know, do you have time? Would you want to come into rehearsal and we'll run through the actual set? Because <laughs> at that point they hadn't touched anything they were planning on doing that night. Um, so they went to the rehearsal room and did the run of songs that appeared, but in a totally different order. And 
then they were going to go do the first set and then come back to the rehearsal room at set break. So Bobby and I went to eat while they were playing their first set and set break. We got back in, they went back in the rehearsal room and did the same run of songs and yet a completely different order. Um, and then Trey came out and, you know, gave me a piece of paper that had this like weird master song list sort of what may or may not be available on it. It's like, I'm going to do two or three songs. I didn't even know what he was pointing at. Um, and he said two or three. So I'm like, all right, uh, I guess I'll just have them standing up there waiting. Um, and then we'll bring them out. And that's what they did. And then they did them in yet a third, completely different order. Um, they came <laughs> off. This is the one that works. Third time. Right. To and this was to finish set two. So this was to finish set two. But when they came off, they realized they never talked about an encore. Um, and so I'm standing there and I just, because, you know, this is how I am. <laughs> I just said, well, you guys all know the Mighty Quinn. You can do that one. And I just shouted that. <laughs> And Trey and Bobby looked at me. I was like, yeah, yeah, great idea. Mike looked at me. Great idea. Paige, yeah, 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 great idea. Fishman looked at me. He's like, who the fuck is this guy? Um, <laughs> but uh, they went and did the Mighty Quinn. Um, That's awesome. That's great. That's your ice. And, One yeah, Trey, time. Trey, Mike and Paige, I worked with actually on the government mule thing. Uh, Mike had done a, a documentary called Rising Low uh, government, after Alan Woody died when government right, mule did this like, 25 bass player album tribute and uh, Mike came and directed the film and then we had Mike and Paige play on the song John Entwistle played on um, um, called Same Price I believe um, and so I'd gotten to know them back back then on that um, and then you know Trey and uh, Trey over the years because he'd sat in with Warren on stuff I had actually I tour managed Mo one year and he happened to do a, some benefit at Roseland with them and the then, Ritz uh, Bauer jam in no, that was no, that was I was too young for that. I remember that I had tapes of that, but yeah, they were um, fantastic. I was too young tapes. to be working for that. No, this was uh, this was uh, a, a Mo thing in two thousand five. Okay. Um, Are you? That's no, awesome. I, I tour managed you them like like everybody. twice in my life. Uh, right. uh, Skip so was you, their long time tour towards, manager. You, you were their manager, Government Mules, in when they played on the Riverboat, and Mo and them did the set where Government no, Mule came out in the middle me. of Moose. Okay. No, I've only done two boat gigs in my life. A uh, Dave Matthews cruise with Rat Dog in 2006, and uh, a jam cruise with both God Street Wine and right. and Bobby's trio at the time with Wasserman and Jay Lane uh, in maybe okay. 2011 or 10. Um, it's the only time I've ever done a boat gig. Um, I covered uh, Skip was their longtime tour manager, and both times he had a his wife had babies. He left the tour, and I covered for him. They were just one off. Uh, um, so I want to. I want to kind of pivot conversation a little bit. I'm always curious when I meet professionals that do this for a living, how much you do this outside of your profession for enjoyment or hobby. Do you go to see a lot of shows? I, I know we were talking in the green room about the fish shows you've been to, but do you, is it weird for you to go to a concert and not be working? Um, less, I go to less than I used to. Um, you know, it, it's, it, it's it's a little harder because you get you know you, you, i find that i'm looking at like the things i would be looking for at my you own show doing you know? this. <laughs> oh i'm looking at what they're doing you know who's doing what on the side of the stage and you know or what the front of how you know i'm, I'm just i'm looking at stuff or i'm finding things stuff that i would you know i'm biting my tongue to not complain like you know why, why aren't they letting anyone dance at a steely dance show or you know like, like you know it, it, yeah it's hard to turn it off and just just be there you know um yeah, we were mentioning that um, some of the fish shows, actually a really fun story I wanted to bring up was your first, or the time you escorted Bill Walton to his first show. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, after after awesome. Fairly Well, yeah, uh, you know, Bill got way into Trey Fairly Well and they spent a lot of time talking. I, I felt like Bill was kind of like taking him like almost like personal head coach or something. <laughs> um, and... Uh, he texted me very shortly after Fairly Well that he saw Fish was going to be in L.A. And it was it was a sort of a double. It was do I want to come with him? And also, do I know who to ask for tickets? <laughs> um, and so, yeah, you know, I reached out to Richard and Patrick and said this, you know, wants to come out. And of course, they rolled out the red carpet for us. Um, you know, we, we got down there and uh, I remember we had dinner. We said hey to the band and. Uh, then we were going out to get ready to go out for the show. It was a GA flows the LA form in 2015. Um, we we're getting ready to go That's out. That's like on the right floor. after Fairly Well. Right, right after Fairly Well. I mean, a month later, maybe at most. Um, and uh, so we were waiting. We were like on the floor off stage right. 
and you know it's a ga floor and 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 you know it wasn't sold out it wasn't uh it was maybe two-thirds full that night so there's plenty of room floor seats i think the whole venue may have been ga i don't, I don't really remember but um i figured he's tall we'll go out somewhere near the soundboard and hang in the back of the floor is me him and his wife and um seems like a reasonable thing for somebody at high so he's like well, wait for the lights go down we'll go out the lights go down and i start to stroll thinking we'll just slowly walk to the back and he makes a hard left into the pit and i'm like oh shit, we're doing this huh <laughs> <laughs> um so what comes next is me getting a, a quick crash course in fish pit politics um <laughs> now bill walton you know everyone's welcomed him with open arms his wife is five foot nothing so you know that's easy but this guy nobody knows this guy who's tagging along with them so they're getting closer and closer to the front and i'm getting elbowed and elbowed further and further away from them and and i'm not you know i'm not gonna bully my way through an audience like i'm just not gonna like i'm not i'm, not, I'm following bill walton out of my way like no I'm, I'm just gonna i'm you know i know what's going on here i know what they're seeing you know i know how long these people waited to be there i'm just not doing that you know yeah um and so at some point, you know, they're pretty close to the front, maybe the equivalent to second or third row. And I'm maybe 10, equivalent to 10 rows behind that. And Bill's just waving me up. And I'm just like, I can't, I'm trying, you know, like, I'm not like, I'm not going in, you know, like, I'm just not doing that. It's just not happening. And he actually, I don't know who he found, sent someone to go get me that they would all listen to when they did. And they started getting out of my way and made, like, made a little room for me. And the sea parted um, a little bit, you know, that was still some funny looks. It was definitely who, you know, it was definitely my share of who, who the fuck was, are you? You yeah. don't belong and, and, here. And you that's fine. Been here. I don't, I get it. I, do, I know what they do to get those. Well, I don't, yes and, and no, that's and, kind of bullshit though. Uh, so I, don't want, right. I don't want it. Right. I don't want to get into, into for well, it's still you're also, we, we've had to go to a lottery too with dead and right. company and, and, you know, like we, you know, we, we've seen it all um you know we just we just had to ban a long-term time fan from the pit um and so uh and i remember antelope greg for when i went to fish shows and all that <laughs> um you know but they made room for me and then the awkward thing became okay now i'm like within eye co contact level of trey and Paige and mike who i all know really well and i don't want to make eye contact with them while they're playing because feels weird and awkward and so i'm like all right i'm just i'll be the guy who stands behind bill because <laughs> no one else wants that spot i got plenty of room i can hear i don't you know i don't need That's to see as much service. as i need to hear and uh you know so i made it work for the set we went back again during set break and i, I said you know what um you guys if you want to go to the front i'm gonna hang kind of off to this it wasn't really that full i could be the equivalent of the 10th right. 12th row on the side and it had plenty of room i'm like i'm gonna just hang on the side here we'll meet right here at the end of the encore and of course, the encore that night was you enjoy myself, so it was a long encore. <laughs> and, and then, yep. uh, you know, we we bolted out of there. It was it was a lot of fun. That's awesome. That's I, 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 I was telling you back. I remember seeing Bill Walton at that show and pointing out to my friend, and you guys literally were about yep. I don't know, 10 feet to my left off that, like right there in the center. And yeah. I remember commenting to my friend, right. though, I'm glad we're even or in front of Bill because anybody <laughs> behind him, you're like, oh, man, down in front, yeah. dude. <laughs> like, I, I never, you know, my eyes are often closed. When, when I used to go to shows, my eyes are often closed, so I don't necessarily need to see the band. Um, yeah, I don't. I just, I just need to hear really well. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's I've an audio seen it plenty of times. Yeah, and that close, you're not really getting the the light show, and, and that was kind of why I also wanted to be further back a little bit. From set two, exactly. and see, and see a little, little bit more of the light show, and it sounds better further back. Like the, the sound isn't best in the pit. Bill was always part of our early start of the show routine and ritual. Do you end up in the show? You look around. If Bill is there, you try to spot him in the audience. Oh, wait, right, like Bill? that. Because yep. like we would, we would always be in like nosebleed or up on the lawn or like you know not. But you could always spot him out because he's always like a good foot and a half above everybody. Oh, spot oh him we do it all. Okay. To, yeah, we we do it all the time. Find Walton. Where's Walton? Find Walton. <laughs> you know, the, the, if I'm taking pictures from the stage, the winners, if I could get a picture while he's doing this, because right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, he does this a lot. It's you know he's. <laughs> That's great. So what's next after Dead and Company for Bobby? Um, I'll have about a week, ten days off, and then uh. We are rehearsing with the Stanford Orchestra for his uh, Grateful Dead Concerto project, which debuts at the Kennedy Center in, in October. Okay. Um, he's got nine piece Wolf Bros supplementing him. And also, then there'll be about a 100 person orchestra uh, with the National wow. Symphony Orchestra. So, we're using Stanford's student orchestra as like our rehearsal orchestra. And, it's cheaper uh, than a professional, huh? <laughs> um, a little bit. 
Um, and, and and honestly, they're really good. We already did one round of rehearsals. I was gonna say, I imagine really Stanford. Well, I just Zappa. I, I remember yeah, hearing Zappa used to always bitch about having to pay professional musicians to do his classical pieces, and like he paid by the note he said or something like that. You know. Y'all anyway. just froze on me just as you started to talk about Zappa. So, so oh, it's for the best. Don't worry about what, it. Which is crazy because you know that sounds like something witchy just happened. But uh, right, no um, Zappa. Bring Zappa, up Zappa and the, and the whole the whole, Zappa, whole computer freezes. Zappa, you, know, you don't have to reiterate it, Kev. It's okay. No, you. Uh, well, it's all right. Um, and uh, so, so um, you're so doing the, the, They were really good. We'll probably end up doing a show with them at some point, like at the Frost or something. Cause they're they're actually really good. Um, no, and then that. is there really a whole Wolf Brothers tour? Is it and then there will the be a, a whole, you know, we're, we're, we're not announcing it till uh, oh. about 10, 12 days. There'll be a whole Wolf Bros tour. Uh, uh, nobody watches this. Don't worry. It's fine. You're <laughs> just so we'll be starting up at, uh, at, we'll be closing the season up at Westfield Music Bowl before the Kennedy Center and then uh, ending uh, November 6th uh, in Colorado. And there'll be a lot in between there. I, I love what he does there with Don Was. It seems like such an odd pairing at first. You know, on paper, because was not was is not what the Grateful Dead was. No, nope, but know? but Wasserman can become was. Just chop right. off a few letters, and you got an upright bass player. There you go. Bobby Love. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Wait, nice. So it's Wasserman, not what you know, was not Wasserman. Was not um, Wasserman. Was not Wasserman. <laughs> just evolved a little bit. He's great. He's one of the one of the greatest uh, musicians, producers, just music people to talk to that I've met. I mean, you know. I bet he's fascinating. I bet Absolutely that... fascinating. He's got some of the best Bob Dylan stories. Um, oh, I bet. You know, Bob Dylan That's will true. call him just for advice on what does my new song sound like, and I was like, "What?" That's wow. awesome. <laughs> All right, That's so we're uh, we're about to come up on it. I hate to say because this is one of the best interviews, at least for me, one of the most enjoyable conversations we've had in a long time. But Very I want to give uh, Kevin T uh, at least an opportunity. If you have any other questions or anything else you wanted to pivot to real quick. This I'll take a, time an to get audience question there. or two if they got any. Yeah, if the audience, the audience wants to throw in a question. There's a. There was a call-in show. I'd let I'd take calls, but I guess it's not calls. <laughs> well, we used to have a call. We had show. one caller, <laughs> and he, he texted he me, calling. and he was like, "I want to call." I was like, oh, "I can't figure it out this season, next season." Josh, I did tell us from the Golden Road once. I think they were nervous to let me take callers, but uh, his <laughs> name was uh, Josh. <laughs> nice. Josh Frosh from Oshkosh was the guy. <laughs> one name. caller. Yes. <laughs> and he really was a big fan of what the Ruby waves at Alpine. Yeah, That's no, right. honestly, these guys man, don't I, come up with questions. They don't think that I appreciate. I appreciate oh, future the DNC you tours. On. There you go, Steely Tom. Future DNC tour. Is we'll that see. happening again next summer? You we'll never see. know. Right. We'll see. There's so many logistics with that. I'm sure. Yeah. All those different people and. I, I, I believe there will be future Denton Company tours. Okay, can I get a shout yeah. out to Chimente? He gets an MVP. He really. Oh, yeah, he yeah I was going to ask is is he ever going to take on a role of a singing a song or get a song specifically just for him ever? Does he even want one? Is this something? He uh, he's do? shy about taking one. We're trying. We we try. We were trying to force one on him, and he was open to learning it. And you know, we ultimately just ran out of time. I think this this summer, um, and it would have been. Would have been epic, but you know, it'll, I can't it'll, wait. I hope he does. I hope he, I hope he gets the chance to do it because I, I love that guy. And I, it'll happen. Yeah. Good, good. Because I've, I've got, I've got some videos of the rehearsal for proof, just in case. Oh, no. <laughs> That's great. I mean, but, but, I, but I, love, I won't post them. I will, I will only show them to people in person. I love seeing O'Teal <laughs> do his songs. I think that's great. And I would love yeah. to see Kamente get in there and do his yeah. as well, because it's just it adds to the whole, you know, the whole like yeah. we said before, the whole story, the whole hearing those songs that were during, during the Wolf guys. Rose tour. Um, Pittsburgh, I believe. Uh, you know, there, there was we had one of the largest follow the whole tour contingents we'd we'd ever had, um, ever had with a Bobby solo project. Even I mean, it was a lot of the Dead and Company. You know, they're all on Dead and Company this summer, and and about a dozen of them made some signs and were in the front row, holding it up, and it said, "Let Jeff sing Alligator." <laughs> Love it. <laughs> and Bobby, Love it. See, they did it for both sets. Bobby caught, I think, more set two, and he walked over to Jeff and he goes, "I feel about learning Alligator." <laughs> Right, I mean, right on stage and you know no one could hear him i could hear him but but the audience couldn't but like you know in that moment he <laughs> that's amazing <laughs> was it him so doing cool. it but uh all right phenomenal. guys man thank you so much for coming on and sharing these stories and talking yeah. with us for a bit absolutely um, thank you i know you're down in san diego hopefully one day i'm gonna up in la so hopefully one day we can get together oh, cool. and yep. hang out or something and see a absolutely. show or whatever but 
It's been fascinating, man. Thank you so much. Yep. yep you and bet. if Thanks, any of guys. you guys out there watching are new to the channel, please subscribe, share this video, share this interview. This has been an awesome season. Sorry, Matt. I want to take a second and thank these guys. Yep. Um, I know you're paying attention back there, Kevin and T. This is a great season. I really had an awesome time. I'm looking back. Season four will come back in September. So we'll plus live. We'll it's be back. Be huge. Am I the season finale? You yeah, are. This is it. Now. Do we need to we gotta get ready for a fish tour. We're gonna do, do recaps of every show. It's not uh, you, got, you got a lot of work coming up. We're going out on the highest note possible with you, though, man. Thank you right. so much. This, this was, was amazing. All right, I love you guys. I'll see you next time. Thank yep. you, Matt. Take care, everybody. Thank you. All.